inihahandog ng UP Diliman Office of the Chancellor Task Force on a Blueprint for Building the Nation ang hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda a Public Launch Pag-angat at pagsulong tungo sa magandang buhay at bukas Good morning and thank you everyone for coming This is the Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda a public launch where the UP Diliman Task Force on Nation Building will present the governance agenda for a sustainable, inclusive, and innovation-driven national development. We are live streaming on UP Diliman hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 and UP CIBS Facebook page. This webinar's co-organizers are the UP Diliman Task Force on Nation Building, an initiative of the UP Diliman Office of the Chancellor and UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies Political Economy Program. The webinar co-presenters are DZUP 1602 and the Diliman Information Office. To start off our program this morning, I would like to call on the Chancellor of UP Diliman, Dr. Fidel Arnemenzo, to give his opening remarks. Dr. Nemenzo. Uh, is he there? Yeah. Hi, hi, Dr. Nemenzo. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today in the public launch of the Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda, which is the university's contribution to the national conversation on policy alternatives leading up to and beyond the coming May 9 elections. This initiative led by the Task Force on a Blueprint for Building the Nation or Task Force Nation Building under the Office of the Chancellor is the university's response to two imperatives of the times. The first is the COVID-19 pandemic in our transition to the post-pandemic situation. The second is the national, coming national and local elections, which has heightened debates on policy issues, political platforms, and our country's future. Needless to say, the Philippines is at a critical juncture in its development, confronting many challenges, which include the decline in, pro in private consumption, high employment, high unemployment, falling incomes amidst inflation, sluggish investments, and worst of all, a potential reversal of the steady decline in poverty in recent years. It is estimated that the Philippine economy will take as long as four de decades to recover from the devastation caused by the pandemic. According to a recent NEDA study, the economy lost about 4.3 trillion pesos in 2020, and stands to lose as much as 37 trillion in the next 10 to 40 years. The pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of the pattern of development and recovery mechanisms of the Philippines. Our country's response has been constrained by governance issues and the lack of development the resources. Now, nonetheless, the crisis has opened up an opportunity to build the country's development track and rethink its direction. There is a need for new and bold policies, processes, and practices for a sustainable and equitable future for all Filipinos. It is this need that anchors the Task Force Nation Building and its webinar series, Hashtag Pilipilunas 2022, Pagbangon at Pagsulong Tungo sa Magandang Buhay at Bukas. The series build, builds on the university's mission to contribute to nation building. And development and brings together UP scholarship and expertise across different disciplines to bear on policy arenas that are important to the national conversation leading up to the elections. Since August of last year, the task force has conducted webinars in nine policy areas, namely economic recovery and transformation, national, the national social protection floor, higher education, industrial policy and nation building, public transportation, local governance, electoral and political reforms, and strategic foreign policy. 
The webinars took the form of roundtable discussions that presented the work and research of UP experts in these fields and were further enriched by the perspectives and contributions of discussions from government, industry, and civil society. What we present to you today is the fruit of this series over the past several months. The hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 governance agenda for a sustainable, inclusive, and innovation-driven national development. This is a blueprint that describes the current situation and offers an analysis of each of the nine policy areas. And on the basis of these analysis, outlines a set of responses or approaches to these problems. As a whole, this document seeks to advance sustainable, equitable, participatory, and innovation-driven national development. We intend to present the UP Diliman hashtag Pilipilunas governance agenda to the national candidates those running for the presidency and the vice presidency, those running for the Senate, as well as to policymakers, industry and civil society stakeholders and the media. Ang uh, webinar ngayong umaga ay paglunod lamang hindi pa tapos ang gawain ng task force. This would not have been possible uh, without the work and contribution of everyone who organized and participated in the webinar series and the production of its governance agenda. I would like to thank the chair of the Task Force Nation Building, Antoinette Rakiza, uh, the members of the Task Force, Jay Batumbakal, Dokoy Capuno, Ivy Claud Claudio, uh, Ton Clemente, Tina, Cl Tina Clemente, Laura David Pancholara, Tessa Tadem, and Maribic Rakiza. Our webinar conveners, Ella Tienza, Happy Denoga, Herman Kraft, Hernan Paragas, Rick Sigua, and Jorge Tigno. Our media partner, DZUP1602, and the Diliman Information Office. I'd also like to thank the many speakers, discussants, moderators, and participants who shared their valuable time and insight in our webinars. And thank you, Veronica, for moderating this, uh, this public launch. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Task Force Secretariat for their tireless work and support over the course of the Pilipilunas 22, 2022 series. To all of you, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Chancellor Nemenso. To our audience, we would like to remind you to please put your questions on the Q&A Google form. The submitted questions will be read during the open forum later. We also encourage the use of hashtag Pilipilunas2022 in posts about this event. These reminders will be flashed on your screen. Now, uh, let us proceed. I'd like to turn over the floor to Professor Maria Ivy Claudio from the UP College of Mass Communication, who will be presenting on behalf of Dr. Marivik Rakiza on the national protection floor. Dr. Uh, Professor Claudio. Magandang umaga po. On behalf of Dr. Maria Victoria Arakiza, I will be reading the recommendations on the national um, social protection floor. So the situation, there is no adequate social protection coverage to protect Filipinos from contingent risks. Based on a report by the Philippine Statistics Office Authority, poverty incidents increased from 16% in 2018 to 18% in 2021, with the number of poor Filipinos increasing from 22 million to 26 million. Some of the most vulnerable groups are children, those with no or inadequate incomes, and older persons, while many Filipinos do not have sufficient access to health care. According to, the DS, according to DSWD, 9.3 million children are poor and about 6.95 uh, million depend on the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or 4Ps. Older persons are vulnerable to escalating health risks, which makes it difficult for them to earn a living. As of 2020, there are about 4 million senior citizens who do not have pensions, according to NEDA, while only 2 million of around 9.5 million senior citizens receive pensions, according to SSS and GSIS. Active age persons are susceptible to income reduction and loss due to sickness, disability, and cycles of unemployment, as well as non-economic factors like the pandemic. 
According to PSA, as of December 2021, there are 3.2 million Filipinos who are unemployed and 6.8 million who are underemployed. In addition, the general public is vulnerable to health hazards due to calamities, disasters, and pandemics, and in turn, very high out-of-pocket spending on health. PhilHealth found that in 2019 alone, out-of-pocket uh, out spending in the country was at 48%, the third highest in the ASEAN region, topped only by Myanmar with 76% and Cambodia with 64%. So what is the blueprint analysis? The implementation of social protection programs in the country is characterized by fragmentation, incoherence, duplication, and gaps. The adoption of the National Social Protection Floor, or NSPF, will address these problems. The implementation of social protection programs in the country by different agencies has led to overlapping programs and issues with administrative efficiencies. Having social protection that is universal would help ensure closer coordination among agencies and lessen inefficiency and um, corruption. Having a transformative social protection means having social and political mechanisms intended to empower the poor and tackle social structures that perpetuate poverty, social exclusion, and discrimination. The 2019 Philippine Operational Framework and Strategy Paper further operationalized the language of universal and transformative social protection. And um, the, what are the, the blueprint recommendations? Uh, I will be reading also uh, these recommendations. The NSPF should be institutionalized for inclusive development, poverty eradication, and promotion of health and well-being. Toward this end, there is a need for committed, purposeful, and deliberate action to build state capacity to implement the NSPF over time. In turn, the rights-based approach positions the state as duty bearer and citizens as claim holders entitled to receive social protection. So other proposals of, of the blueprint um, include to support the assessment-based national dialogue or ABND with a view to rationalizing and expanding social protection programs within a rights-based, universal, transformative social development strategy. To avoid incoherence, fragmentation, duplication, and gaps in implementing the social protection programs, we have to support and implement a vital component um, to formulating the NSPF initiative, which is, as I've said, to implement the ABND. Build the state's fiscal and um, administrative capacity, as well as technical competence to implement the NSPF over time. And lastly, partner with civil society organizations or CSO and social movement groups using participatory governance approaches to implement the NSPF and to raise people's awareness and mobilization in support of this initiative. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ivy Claudio. And now I'd like to call on Dr. Renato Reside, an associate professor from the UP School of Economics to present the policy recommendations on the area of economic recovery and transformation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, businesses closed, unemployment shut up, and the country lost a lot of income. That's around one and a half trillion in 2020 alone and borrowed a significant amount of debt to finance the needed expenditures for health and economic stimulus. So the stimulus was important because uh, it was needed to prop up our economy. Next. Although the pandemic did not push us to a fiscal crisis, the country needs to revert back to a path that will restore our resiliency and support future growth. So a lot of the expenditures that uh, uh, we incurred uh, uh, were meant to prop us up in the absence of uh, a lot of private expenditures because uh, of the pandemic and the lockdowns. 
So actions to improve institutional governance, further stimulate the economy and strengthen business and health resilience needs to be taken. Next. This means that uh, the Philippines needs to exert a mix of effort uh, uh, to pursue health and productivity enhancing expenditures, like for example, infrastructure spending and other kinds of uh, productivity enhancing spending. Uh, and health enhancing spending, replenishing our resources through tax reforms on electronic commerce and other means, building an environment that will enhance competitiveness of industries by improving business laws, regulation, and also strengthening our uh, export industries. Next. Strengthening the business environment for micro small and medium enterprises or MSMEs um, uh, by improving the efficiency and productivity of MSMEs through performance trade and trade facilitation and providing access to financing. So credit constraints are an important barrier to success for our, our MSMEs and uh, we all want them to be capable of uh, investing. Investing and in public in expenditures in strengthening the health sector and development of financial markets uh, will enable us to pursue broad-based growth, reduce our vulnerability uh, in terms of health, and improve intermediation of savings, respectively, that ultimately will allow us to also finance uh, additional public expenditures that are growth-enhancing. Next. So uh, the recommendations include upgrading of social protection for vulnerable groups and improving delivery of social services, investing in education and training of workers to improve productivity and to enable workers to absorb emerging technologies to support employment and also to uh, enable us to attract industries that will allow us to grow um, and also allow workers to adapt given the structural changes taking place in our economy. Uh, the uh, resulting growth from all of these efforts uh, accompanied by tax reforms will allow us to expand our tax base uh, that will allow us to finance continuous support for productivity enhancing expenditures and also allow us to pay for the additional debt that we incurred uh, during the crisis. Next. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reside. And now to present the policy recommendations on higher education, let us welcome Dr. Dina Ocampo, professor from the UP College of Education. Magandang umaga po sa kanilang lahat. Next slide, please. Philippine higher education faces compounded challenges that pre-existed before and which were brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. The first cluster of challenges centers on access to and the quality of higher education. Only 12% of poor students are able to participate in higher education program offerings. Another very important concern, but this is usually overlooked, is about the unevenness of quality across higher education institutions. Whilst there are institutions that deliver programs excellently, there are those that are substandard. Poor quali program quality is affected by various factors such as teacher quality and preparation, learning environment, facilities, equipment, and support systems for learners. The lack of quality in any of these factors impacts on student learning and their preparation for the world of work entrepreneurship, or further education. Next slide, please. The second cluster of challenges is caused by the most impactful of recent disruptors, the COVID-19 pandemic. This has caused institutions, teachers, and students to abruptly change ways of teaching and learning. They sought ways to communicate over distances caused by the prolonged educational disruption, lack of appropriate devices, and lack of connectivity. A feeling of inadequacy pervades among all participants in the education process. 
instructors continue to be uncertain about the effectiveness of their teaching and whether their students are actually learning. The lack of face-to-face -face interactions and competence in using remote learning strategies compromise teachers' assessment of student engagement and the attainment of learning objectives. However, there is no turning back to the way education was delivered before the pandemic, and not just for health reasons. The last two years have brought forward new and effective ways to provide education for all learners. The challenge lies in being able to harness the promises of blended learning for accessible quality higher education. Next slide, please. The third cluster of challenges has to do with changing communities, diversity, and continuity in human development. In 2016, with the start of the senior high school program, the country had more 16 to 17 year old students enrolled in schools than ever before. Over 11,000 senior high schools were opened all over the country. In comparison, there are only about 7,000 higher education and technical vocational institutions combined. It can be inferred that many senior high school graduates will not have the opportunity to proceed to tertiary education. This shows a lack of intentional continuity. Again, this shows a lack of intentional continuity in education provision for the country's youth. This discrepancy can be mitigated by strategic planning of edu educational opportunities on the ground, which encourages complementarity between and among state and private institutions. Doing so is of particular importance because the nature and growth trajectories of communities are very different. For example, as communities urbanize, these, the needed skills of people in these areas evolve as well. The impact on educational opportunities made available to learners, which in turn should respond, which should in turn respond to individual community and national development goals. The challenge here is how to actively engage community stakeholders to demand for available and continuously improving quality in higher education programs for youth and community members. Next slide, please. In view of these challenges and contexts, the following recommendations are put forth. First, government should ensure a consistent quality of and equitable access to higher education, alternative systems of learning, as well as flexible accreditation and recognition systems should be institutionalized. Second, the government should invest in technology and connectivity, especially in rural areas. Teachers must be provided with adequate training, equipped to handle various modes of teaching, and empowered to develop and implement innovations to curricula. Blended learning delivery mode should be supported and institutionalized, encouraged even. These include a mix of synchronous on-site learning, on-site based learning, and asynchronous technology supported learning. This will ensure that higher education is accessible to more and responsive to emerging learning models and styles. Another possibility is that microlearning which are shorter lessons that are condensed to the most essential elements can be incorporated into online courses. These, however, must be balanced with opportunities for people to be in nature, socialize with peers, and engage in physical activities to promote the holistic development of persons. Stackable development programs, micro-credentialing, flexible formal and non-formal learning systems, will strengthen higher education, especially through a systematic, when a systematically embedded um, Philippine credit transfer system is, is already in place. Options for flexible learning, such as alternative learning systems, expanded accreditation, and diverse technical vocational training should also be maximized. 
Finally, with a fourth, third, with stronger linkages and dynamic cooperation mechanisms, um, groups can be innovative in enabling learners to develop more complex competencies. Finally, to ensure equity in higher education, multiple parallel and interactive lifelong learning pathways and superhighways should be designed based on the principles of excellence, diversity, and inclusion. Done in synergy, these actions will enable schools to propel Filipinos towards meaningful socioeconomic lives, and more importantly, meet the learners where their dreams for the future lie. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Ocampo. Moving on, I would like to call on Dr. Giovanni Tapang, Dean of the UP College of Science, to present the recommendations on industrial policy. Good morning, everyone. Um, next slide, please. Um, industrial development has gained a beachhead in our Philippine development, but it remains fragile until now. In particular, manufacturing continues to struggle due to low productivity and investments, notably by way of the country's small and medium enterprise sector, and of course, the science and technology community. Next, please. And industrial development, as I've said, remains weak, and have, we have seen this in, the, in the, its extreme vulnerability, the external shocks like the debt crisis in the 1970s and the 1980s, and in the financial crisis of the 1998 and the 2008. While the pandemic, the health crisis sent our economy to a deep recession, only manufacturing took a hit and it contracted by around 1.4% from 2018 to, uh, from 2018 to 2020. And there is very little link between the country's micro and small enterprises that make up more than 90% of businesses in the formal economy. And with the education, there appears to be a disconnect between education and the human resource requirements that is being asked for our country's industrial development. Next, please. The blueprint analysis Industrial development in the country is weighed out by several factors, including the low public investment in science and math education, the lack of academic and industrial institutional collaboration in research and development, and a growth pattern that is based largely on trade in services that has been found to contribute to premature in deindustrialization. Next. Higher education. It plays a very critical role in national development, and the government needs to provide this reg a regular mechanism for industry and university interface that will facilitate technological innovation, as well as to continue to fund joint problem-solving research and the diffusion of technological innovation is needed for industrial growth. The massive flow of remittances has influenced our investment behavior towards businesses that cater to the, what is needed by the remittance receiving households, thus contributing to this the industrialization that we have seen. Next one. The country has about three decades of trade and investment liberalization, and yet we have not seen resources towards building higher value activities. There are no programs for retooling, for soft loans, research and development programs, or incentive to help our domestic companies to raise their competitiveness. These programs could also include marketing support to help industrialize, industries modernize, upgrade, and gain competitiveness. And thus, our blueprint recommendations, there is a need to promote an industrial policy that prioritizes the development of domestic small and medium enterprise sectors, as well as the building blocks of industrial development to promote synergies between manufacturing, agriculture, and services, so that we can use our Filipino ingenuity and capacity towards the development of niche industries and jumpstart our structural transformation. Next, please. As such, we want to help MS, uh, our recommendations also would include to help the uh, MSMEs to integrate into the global value chain, 
to strengthen the role of manufacturing in industry associations and cross linkages and to acknowledge the role of academe as an innovator and incubator for emerging technologies and industries that will be used in their industrial development. Next, please. We also need to review the Retail Trade Bill, Senate Bill 1840, and other legislations that open the MSME sector to foreign competition that will threaten and displace small producers, household enterprises, and workers. We also need to provide investment opportunities in local manufacturing and other industrial concerns for overseas Filipinos and remittance receiving households. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Tapang. Before we move on to the second set of presenters, let us remind the participants to please post your questions for the open forum in the Google form. The link for this is in the Zoom chat. To continue our presentations for this morning, I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Noriel Teglau, a professor from the UP College of Public Administration and Governance, to present the policy recommendations on public transportation. Dr. Teglau. Good morning, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll present the, uh, the situation and the blueprint analysis uh, for public transport, which is the result really of uh, the webinar uh, and ongoing work uh, by different uh, groups uh, last year. So uh, really there is serious economic loss due to uh, inefficient transport system in the country and this is exacerbated by poor public transport. I think uh, this is a daily experience uh, pre-pandemic. And right now, when things are normalizing, it seems that uh, nothing much has changed in terms of uh, mobility experience for everyone. So the blueprint analysis uh, points out to four areas or key challenges in, in public transport. Uh, by the way, inefficiency in the country's transport uh, system, uh, you know, has uh, uh, has been amounting to about 3.5 billion worth of uh, potential income per day, and uh, this is uh, expected to increase to 5.4 billion per day by 2035 if these are not addressed. So the key challenges in this sector. And number one is the disconnect between the strategic vision and implementation reality. Uh, so take the case uh, of policies, for example, that prioritize uh, public over private transport uh, as uh, uh, mandated under the national transport policy uh, in 2017. Uh, secondly, uh, the integration of land use and transport remain an elusive target in the country's uh, national transport planning system. So really this inefficiency comes from or stems from the disconnect between uh, what is envisioned in a policy and what is rolled out in, uh, in actual systems and programs. Second is uh, there's a too much focus on visible aspects of tr public transport, such as infrastructure, uh, while there needs to be, on the other hand, uh, more focus instead on institutional mechanisms. Uh, and th there's a need to, to uh, pursue synergistic and complementary uh, policies uh, that should uh, go hand in hand with infrastructure development. Third is that there's too many agencies uh, handling public transport concerns, but largely from a fragmented uh, system uh, and uh, a lack of uh, uh, alignment in terms of actions and initiatives. And the fourth one uh, points to the need to create a harmonious uh, uh, relationship uh, among key players in the public transport. Next slide. So the recommendation really is to improve uh, public transport uh, through a multi-stakeholder, uh, uh, multi-level, multi-perspective approach. 
uh, improving uh, you know, prioritizing institutional capacity should require a thorough evaluation of the national and government agencies involved to identify areas that need reform, capacity building, and upskilling. Uh, collaborative governance is necessary to consistently implement policies. For example, the business sector can work closely with government regulators to enhance mobility systems. Uh, the power of the crowd can be harnessed through crowdsourcing where stakeholders can be tapped to compile uh, data from the ground and of course propose solutions. And finally, uh, co-production can be used to understand the needs of the users and involve them in the design and delivery of intended services. Next slide. So the recommendation here is to sustain the momentum of reforms and transitions under the uh, Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program, which is a landmark policy introduced in 2017 to completely reform the transport sector into an environmentally sustainable system. And uh, the PUVMP, among others, mandates local government units to identify their uh, route network modes and number of units uh, for delivering public transport services under their uh, local public transport route plans. But, uh, you know, of course, industry, uh, as part of this PUBMP, industry consolidation, fleet modernization uh, are important, but also there's, there's a need for just transition that uh, supports the welfare of transport industry workers and operators. Uh, in improving public transport. Also, there, there should be an orderly sequencing of actions that are critical for the success of the PUBMP, uh, which starts from uh, regulatory reforms, formulation and submission of uh, local public transport route plans, route rationalization, and then fleet modernization. To date, only half of the total LG have submitted their LPTRPs. Meanwhile, the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board has approved only about 96 or 6.4 percent of the LGUs uh, has been given notice of compliance and only a fraction have established LPTRP. So for the last recommendation in the next slide, uh, there's a need to establish uh, a unified agency that has the capacity to oversee and address public transport concerns and the agency should have the capacity to address different uh, you know, uh, concerns at the planning, operation, and monitoring of public transport operations in collaboration with different stakeholders. The passage of a bill institutionalizing the PUBMP should be prioritized to ensure necessary uh, you know, the, the sustainability of the program as well as consistent implementation at various levels of government. And among others, the legislation should actively provide support mechanisms to establish uh, cooperative arrangement and strong partnerships among the different stakeholders at the strategic, tactical, and operational levels. Finally, the le legislation should strengthen uh, existing research and capacity building programs of educational institutions. For example, the university's National Center for Transportation Studies has been conducting the longest running transport uh, training programs in the country but needs to integrate other disciplines. With this, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Tiglao. Moving on, we would like to welcome Dr. George Tigno, professor from the UP Department of Political Science to talk about electoral and political reforms. Magandang uh, umaga po. Perhaps more than anything else, it can be said that politics in the Philippines has evolved into a largely personal and personality-oriented system. Therein lies a serious challenge to reforming our political system towards making it more representative, accountable, and effective, and making it truly collective and public-oriented. Likewise, the electoral process, and along with it, Party organizations in the country are confronted with numerous challenges to their credibility and effectiveness in consolidating and strengthening our democracy. Uh, Philippine political elites look upon parties as only marginally significant to securing electoral victory and even government control. Money and machine politics, name recall, as well as violence, intimidation, and patronage have become the hallmarks of elections in the country, uh, perpetuated and reinforced by peculiarities and 
ambiguities in both the 1987 Constitution and the Omnibus Election Code. Uh, in the last two to three decades, we've seen dozens of uh, congressional in initiatives put forward in an attempt to reform the party and electoral systems of the country. For the most part, uh, these uh, reform initiatives revolve around requiring parties to craft a clear policy agenda and program of governance, setting limits on voluntary contributions to parties, imposing penalties for turncoats, and establishing a state subsidy fund for uh, party groups. Uh, the same bills are filed and refiled over and over. None have passed into law. Creating a strong and stable consensus-based and reform-oriented uh, leadership on the part of uh, the uh, uh, political uh, leadership in terms of the legislative agenda of the executive are vital to the passage of effective electoral and political reforms. Most importantly, such electoral reforms require some groundswell of public and popular support uh, in order to uh, be fruitful and effective. Uh, any proposal to reform or transform the party system would not go very far uh, without an accompanying uh, effort to reform the electoral system. Many of these electoral reform initiatives would not even require constitutional change uh, and at the same time have the added benefit of making elected political actors more representative, more effective, and more accountable. There are many ways or many areas of opportunity for electoral innovation and reform. Such reforms would not require, as I said, amending the constitution, which can be acrimonious and can be done by uh, acts of legislation. Uh, these uh, reforms also uh, can create more democratically inclined uh, uh, arrangements. Allow me to highlight a few of them. The political leadership may want to make it a legislative priority to amend the Party List System Act of 95 by simply removing the provision that limits party list representation to a maximum of three seats per party list. A congressional initiative uh, may also be in the direction of desynchronizing our elections so as not to unduly burden or confuse our voters with so many choices every time we have an election. Uh, Congress can also consider changing the way that the president and vice president are separately elected into a joint or tandem ticket. This would allow for a less conflicted executive branch and also fully harness the office of the vice president as an extra pair of hands, feet, eyes, and ears of the president. At the end of the day, these reform initiatives should not just be raised only during elections. Electoral reforms are issues that need to be raised even when there are no elections to allow for people and the Congress and the political leadership to fully assess and determine what are effective and appropriate for the country. Adopting this whole of society approach is crucial to seeing through these reforms. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Tigno. Now let us move on to the policy recommendations on local governance. To make a presentation, we have Dr. Ella Atienza, a professor from the UP Department of Political Science. Dr. Atienza, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. Magandang umaga. What's the situation for local governance in the Philippines? Based on many assessments in three decades of uh, devolution, decentralization under the 1991 Local Government Code, despite its lofty goals, has fallen short of promoting democratization, self-sustaining economic development, and social justice. This year, 2022, is very crucial for LGU. Of course, we know that it is an election year, but uh, there are two developments that are very significant when we talk about local governance. This year marks the beginning of the implementation of the Supreme Court's Mandanas-Garcia ruling 
which increased the base of national fiscal transfers to LGUs, and Executive Order 138, which calls for full devolution of the delivery of basic services. These are happening while LGUs are still facing the challenges caused by the pandemic. In terms of our analysis, can we go to the next slide, please? Despite uh, some very trailblazing and progressive uh, LGUs that have been awarded for their exemplary performance, many LGUs capacity to perform their devolved functions is still lacking. People's participation is low due to monopolized power at the local level, and there is underrepresentation of women and other basic sectors in local leadership. We have enumerated at least four challenges uh, in terms of local governance, there remains first, there remains the question about the capacity of LGUs to perform devolved functions specifically in the delivery of public services. Second, there is a question of whether the funds to be transferred to the LGUs are enough to provide all the corresponding services and responsibilities that will be given to the local units. Third, popular participation and decision making at the local level are also crippled by the presence of political dynasties. And fourth, as mentioned by my colleague, Professor Jorge Signo, reforms in the electoral and party systems are necessary because they may open more opportunities for women and other sectors to participate in local processes. Uh, what are our recommendations to improve local governance? Our recommendations stem from a number of uh, points. Resources provided to the LGU should be commensurate with the services to be devolved. And the capacity of the LGUs to sufficiently manage the resources and deliver public services. At the same time, it's important to ensure representation of the sex of basic sectors and women in local government. So we have uh, a number of uh, specific recommendations in the area of local governance. First, amend the code's distribution formula of the shares in national revenues to make sure that provinces and municipalities, which bear most of the devolved responsibilities, have commensurate resources. And also for poorer LGUs to get more shares than cities and more economically developed LGUs. Second, increase LGUs' capacity building on effective financial management and resource mobilization national and local relations, personal administration, and government performance assessment. Third, improve coordination between different levels of government, stronger implementation of accountability and transparency mechanisms, regular consultations with national government agencies like the DILG and the DBM, and other stakeholders such as universities and civil society organizations. Next slide, please. We also recommend creating programs for information dissemination and skills training for citizens and communities to raise awareness about relevant laws, including the local government code and the responsibilities of citizens, as well as the creation of more opportunities for the public to participate in local processes. Reform and strengthen the party and electoral system including enacting a law or incorporating in the local government code the process of selecting the mandated three sectoral representatives in the local Sangunian and incorporating more representation for women, for instance, including the super style uh, system, alternating men and women on candidate lists and in tickets at both national and local levels. And finally, on the issue of uh, political dynasties, introduce anti-dynasty provisions at the lowest local levels like the barangays first because we have noted that uh, it's very difficult to pass the uh, anti-political dynasty provision in the constitution at the national level but um, the philippines was successful actually in inserting a provision in the sangguniang kabataan reform act of 2016 that pertains to the anti-dynasty provision. So we recommend that we start at the lowest local levels in actually controlling or limiting the role of political dynasties and creating an uh, environment that is more competitive and fair for many sectors at the local level. Marami pong salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Atienza. 
And now to present our last, last policy area, let us welcome Professor Herman Kraft from the UP Department of Political Science to present the policy recommendations on foreign relations. Professor Kraft, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, that was in, uh, interesting about the idea of uh, being the lost presenter. Um, I, I don't know if uh, <laughs> foreign relations is actually a lost area, um, but um, I, I guess one of the things that uh, uh, we need to take into consideration is how important foreign relations is, of course, in the course of how states uh, engage in what they, they are supposed to do. No? Um, and one of the things that's been observed as far as uh, the Philippines is concerned no, um, is, of course, the uh, the, the extent to which uh, there has been a lack of consistency uh, and continuity in the uh, kind of uh, 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 foreign policy that we've actually uh, uh, enacted, no? um, generally over, over time, but more specifically no, over the last uh, uh, two administrations. No? So it's the failure of the Philippines to establish a stable and consistent foreign relations no, with long-term national goals that we need to actually uh, emphasize you know, as far as the incoming uh, administration is actually concerned. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, this non-continuity is actually uh, 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 influenced largely by the, I, I think uh, Professor Tigno pointed out the personalistic character of Philippine politics. And this actually spills over into foreign policy where the foreign policy thrust no, of the Philippines no, is largely influenced by the leaders' perceptions no, as the main character of foreign policy. Next slide, please. Um, and so in this, in this context, no, we're actually making some recommendations no, um, regarding the... Uh, 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 oh, uh, can, can you move back to uh, uh, the previous slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so in, in this context, no, um, the, the perception of the, of the um, uh, leader being the uh, main, car, uh, main architect of foreign policy can be seen in terms of what has actually happened regarding the West Philippine Sea, for instance, no? um, where the difference between the approach taken by the Aquino administration in constructing China as the other to build domestic support no? um, was seen largely as uh, a part of its uh, efforts not to consolidate the country's position in relation to China's overreach no, uh, in the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, in the area. The Duterte administration actually took a very different uh, attack, no, going the opposite direction by moving closer to China and forging partnerships with non-traditional uh, uh, partners like uh, Russia no, uh, uh, and, and, and China. Consequently, it has sought to redefine dominant identities and national building uh, uh, nation building that may contribute to some degree of uh, fragmentation. No, um, and so in this particular context, no, um, we can see uh, the that the influence no of uh, the um uh, uh of the president no, uh, and the lack of participation or or uh, continuity no in in the way that we conduct our foreign policy no is a major issue that has to be uh, uh, addressed. So ne next slide, please. So. There's a need for us, no, as far as recommendations on this particular area is actually concerned, no. There's a need for us to review the functions and mandates of the National Security Council as the lead agency when it comes to national security governance, no, and particularly as it influences and in, uh, uh, impacts on uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, uh, secondly, foreign policy should actually sustain strong and uh, secure regional alliances, no. Um, to manage the new realities in the West Philippines in particular by using diplomacy to shape the environment not to the country's best advantage. The problem, of course, is uh, the extent to which geopolitical issues no, uh, that, that uh, uh, involves uh, the intensifying competition between the great powers no, might actually factor into the kinds of calculations that we need to do uh, in, in, this, in this context. So there is a need to change the perspective on the West Philippine Sea. No, uh, it is more than just an arena for confrontation between the major powers. No, um, it is actually important. No, as a powerhouse of resources that we need to actually be able to access. No, and and be able to take advantage of. Next slide, please. No, um, and therefore research in the West Philippine Sea should actually be uh, given uh, uh, importance. No, and and. Um, 
uh, as well as the um, uh, policies that 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 uh, seek to uh, explore and exploit and manage you know, those activities that um, uh, or uh, to pursue activities you know, that explore, exploit, you know, and manage uh, the uh, West Philippine Sea should actually be promoted and and, and maintained. You no, know? now in this context, you no, know, there is a need to bring in the academic community, especially the University of the Philippines, to establish multiple platforms where the public can engage in foreign policy discussions. In fact. Um, one of the things that uh, we have to take into consideration, going back to the point that was made regarding um, the dominance no, of uh, uh, the executive as far as uh, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, is concerned, no, is the need to involve the public uh, in the discourse on uh, uh, the public discourse on and debates no, on foreign policy issues. No? Um, to a large extent, the police, the 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 uh, public has taken a a, a backseat, no, to all of these uh, uh, issues, and I think it is time to bring uh, the public into no, uh, 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 into these discussions. Um, in, in other words, one of the one of the observations has been that um, uh, foreign policy issues never factor into. Uh, 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 things like, for instance, elections. Now, when in fact it is one of the principal, uh, as as has been discussed, now one of the principal bases by which we actually be uh, should be looking at um, uh, who should become the uh, uh, president. So for this, no, um, thank you very much, no, uh, and this is the these are the results of what we've discussed, no, in the webinar on foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kraft. At this point, I'd like to thank all our presenters who discussed the eight policy areas contained in the governance agenda we are launching this morning. Now let us move on to the open forum. Presenters, kindly open all your cameras and your microphones. And our first question is, in Tagalog, maari po bang isama sa governance agenda ang pagsasalin ng mga polisiya at batas sa Filipino at mga wikang regional. Anybody would like to answer that question? Anyone among our presenters? Uh, let me repeat the question. <clears throat> Maari po bang isama sa governance agenda ang pagsasali ng mga polisiya at batas sa Filipino at mga wikang regional? Yes, Professor Ocampo, would you like to answer that question? Um, I'm sure that can be arranged, um, Veronica. And um, I think that the verse, the written version is almost ready for release. Um, Dr. Rakisa Marie oh, yeah. will yes. be able to answer more fully. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Um, yeah, so we're releasing the, because this is the public launch, we are releasing the I don't know the, the governance agenda today. But we will we will work on coming up with at least the Filipino version. Um, I think that's a you know it, it's it's an imperative that we, we need to respond to. So we will announce it soon. Thank you for that question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ocampo and Dr. Rakiza. Our next question is how do we ensure that the national government would be able to listen, understand, and adapt the recommendations stated in the governance agenda? Anyone? Okay, let me start and then the others can, can join in. So what we are so we are releasing now the governance agenda, but at the same time, we will also be sending the a copy to the presidential candidates, the senatorial candidates, and, and, uh, and also agencies, as uh, the chancellor mentioned. Um, with that, we also, of course, need the help of, uh, of, of uh, people who are listening in to, you know, um, if you have the uh, governance agenda, to help us in terms of advocating the policy recommendations that we are proposing. But rest assured, assured that we will, in fact, pursue yung policy recommendations, at least to uh, uh, send it and give and, and have a dialogue or, or discussion with the policymakers. Maraming salamat. Anyone else? Dr. Atienza, would you like to say something? 
uh, yeah, I think uh, we also invited uh, some uh, uh, of the important committee uh, members of the House of Representatives to be here. And we also hope, because they are actually the the secret weapons, the, uh, the regular permanent staff of the both the House and the, the Senate uh, offices, the committee heads, all the secretaries of the committees, uh, they can actually be the ones to present to the specific committees our recommendations and of course the senators, the representatives, and of course whoever is in charge of the specific committees where our recommendations can be considered. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Veronica. Yes, um, Dr. Ra. Right. Um, and this is just to second uh, what uh, uh, Ella mentioned, no? uh, that in fact, uh, the tendency is for, uh, for us to always uh, give our recommendations or submit our recommendations no, to the incoming administration, to the politicians who are the ones who change no? uh, uh, per, per administration. I think one of the things that we have to take into consideration is what Ella was pointing out was that um, you do have a part of the government that is continue, that, that provides continuity, right? And that's the bureaucracy, you know, the staff. And that's where I think uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, to, to, to establish our networks, you know, the technical committees you know, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, legislature, the, bureaucrat, uh, the, um, uh, the bureaucrats you know, uh, who are responsible for uh, uh, running uh, uh, or, or uh, implementing policies, no. So um, there might be a need to also bring them in, no. Uh, as far as uh, 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 submitting or giving our recommendations to uh, uh, government, it's not just the incoming administration, no. Uh, meaning to say, whoever is going to be elected, it's actually who will be. No, advising uh, the incoming administration that that might be an import, uh, important players no, as far as this concerned. Thank you. All right. Uh, you're raising your high hand, Doctor. Yeah. And maybe one last point uh, is also to build a constituency around uh, these points because it's not only just the government who has to act on these uh, uh, recommendations. It's also us, everybody, and even without them doing it first. We have to build our constituency. That includes uh, fora like this as well, the university, people's movements, etc. asking for these changes to be done. Uh, because of course, if we leave it all to them, then it depends on what interest they want to bring. But if we continue on asking for all of these changes um, in governance, uh, not only in the next administration, but continuing beyond that, then maybe we could be successful in changing uh, the path of the Philippines. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, since media holds a huge position in shaping the perceptions of the society, how do we mobilize the media to promote the governance agenda? Anyone? Yeah, Dr. Rakisa? Ah, no, I was thinking maybe uh, Dr. Tigno can, can respond to that since uh, his, uh, the webinar also discussed the role of social media. Hey, Dr. Okay. Tigno? Okay, uh, I've been volunteered to, <laughs> to answer. <laughs> uh, okay. So the media is very important because it's a channel for uh, public discussion, uh, a channel for uh, you know, disseminating information, relevant information that the people need, actually. Uh, so when when they do vote, uh, it's an informed vote. Uh, but uh, of course, there's uh, that problem of uh, disinformation and misinformation that uh, comes around during elections, especially during this time, especially now when you have uh, social media platforms that uh, act as a kind of uh, channel or purveyor of such uh, misinformation or disinformation. And so I mean, what, what I would uh, say is that, you know, these, these issues have to be brought up uh, publicly and, and also not just brought up and say, you know, we want this to happen and that to happen, but more about, uh, I mean, it, there should be, and I, I pointed this out in my presentation, presentation as well, that there should be some kind of groundswell of support mm -hmm. also for these reforms in order for the politicians to listen. 
because if there's no groundswell of support, I mean, and I think Dr. Tapang also mentioned this about the consensus building kind of uh, constituency building kind of uh, effort. Uh, so, so that politicians are going to be pushed into, uh, you know, at least considering these reforms and eventually adopting them. So, yun lamang po. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Veronica Sidina. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add to that just a bit. Um, first, in the, in the education talk. Um, that was one of the key points eh, that community stakeholders must demand for quality and continued, continued availability of programs for the youth and the citizens. All ages, yeah, no? not just higher. Though the focus of our talk today was higher ed. But that, that intentional continuity of education opportunities, that should be um, there. No? So, um, but in, with regards to media and social media, the... The battle against um, fake news, no, and disinformation. I think it's not just um, tied to the elections, though it really heightens during this time, no. Um, even during the time of the health crisis, diba? the very beginning, so much fake news and wrong information was going around. And I think apart from, I think one of the things we need to do is to see that education can be done in non-formal and informal pathways, no including social media. And so we must be able to exact from traditional media their, their professional ethics that they, that they actually present to the public credible information, validated information. And then people who now spread that over social media should also make their own validation. And education has so much to do with that. The education through social media, about social media, is something that we probably need to focus on and, and demand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo. Our next question is, can the governance agenda be adapted in a local or regional or city or municipal perspective? Anyone? Can I? <laughs> yes, Dr. Veronica. Yes, yes uh, of course, uh, linking with the uh, local governance agenda, uh, one of our recommendations is for the LGUs and other stakeholders to actually work with universities and colleges, particularly those that are located in their particular areas in capacity building, training, and uh, skills development, as well as in monitoring. So, definitely, we can uh, work with the uh, local governments uh, and uh, stakeholders at the local level in implementing many of this and at the same time also building at the starting at the local level uh, a constituency that will also elevate elevate some of these concerns up to the national level thank you okay anyone else may i also add uh veronica yes yes, yes, yes uh, from uh, public transport i think this uh, this has always been the the cycle no new uh, leaders uh, coming from the cold, no. Uh, there's a learning curve. It takes them about three years to learn the policies and the, you know the ins and outs of the industry and the sector. So I think uh, definitely we can bring this uh, uh, governance agenda down to the local stakeholders. Uh, in our recommendation, there's a need for co-production, collaborative governance, so that uh, you know new leaders uh, and new department uh, heads of the executive can learn actually. Uh, so I suggest it's really a bottom-up as well as a top-down approach for public transport. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tiglao. Can I add? Yes, please. Professor, Professor Reside. Professor. Yeah, uh, the Mandana's ruling actually was a very important uh, event that uh, gave has given the uh, LGUs a lot of uh, new resources that they did not have before. Uh, and uh, with these additional resources, they, as uh, Dr. Achienza said, no, uh, they have to be equipped with uh, a lot of uh, capacity to undertake uh, uh, efficient uh, delivery of uh, public goods and services. No? So uh, to the extent that their governance is enhanced and improved, and if they follow best practice and we can help them along those lines, uh, then uh, things will turn out uh, uh, all right for them. Okay, thank you, Professor Reside. Uh, we move on to our next question. Can you expound the recommendation of removing the cap of 
party list representatives. How can removing the cap help in political reform? Okay, uh, I think uh, that questions questions yes. addressed to me. Uh, I, I believe I answered this already in the Q and A uh, chat box. But just to respond, removing the, the cap would allow for would force basically party organizations to consolidate themselves uh, and and uh, create larger organizations that will allow them to have more representatives. As it is now with the three seat cap. The uh, tendency of uh, political organizations like party list groups is to fragment themselves, cut themselves up to increase the chance of uh, getting more seats. Okay, uh, so with a consolidated uh, uh, party organization, then there, there will be a, um, a move towards generating more uh, consensus uh, views uh, to be for the party list organizations to be more inclusive, you know, so you don't have to deal with micro organizations uh, like what we have now that try to get only one or two or three seats. Um, in addition, I mean, it's right now, it's, uh, shall we say, cheap to get a party list seat, you know, mm -hmm. cheaper than even getting a district seat. Uh, and much cheaper than getting a, a national position in the Senate. Uh, and so uh, cheapening you know, the, <laughs> the position uh, doesn't improve it, certainly. Uh, and, and so what we want is to uh, strengthen party organizations so that, uh, I mean, no one family, no one individual can take control of it. And, and it becomes more inclusive in life. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so we move on to the next question uh, from one of our viewers. I agree, Po, that the upcoming May 9 elections are crucial for all sectors. Thank you for sharing your policy alternatives. But I'm curious as to how much of these recommendations are considered by the candidates into their respective platforms and or which of these have actually been implemented by their previous or incumbent offices. Anyone? Can I share uh, yes. something? Um, okay. Uh, probably there's an impression that uh, candidates uh, don't really incorporate uh, recommendations from the academe. No? But uh, in my experience, I have found that uh, candidates do so uh, sometimes. No? So there are exceptions. No? Uh, they they can either reach out to the academe before they get elected and or after they get elected. No, so and uh, in fairness to certain uh, to political candidates uh, uh, from the economics uh, profession, uh, they have uh, reached out to us, the man. No? Uh, and so we have we do have experience of uh, candidates uh, reaching out to us both before and after they become elected. And uh, in the case of uh, the economics uh, field, sometimes there are uh, uh, there's, there's, there there seems to be no choice but to adopt or to adopt uh, certain uh, recommendations that we have, no? Because the country spent a lot of money uh, trying to battle the COVID pandemic, and uh, we borrowed a lot, no? To uh, uh, to finance uh, the uh, uh, the buying of vaccines and all other public expenditures just to stimulate our economy. So we have to, I don't think there's a choice, but to uh, look for uh, good and sustainable ways to finance these things. And part of that would be um, uh, tax reform. So that's one of our recommendations. And uh, there are many pending tax reforms right now in uh, in the in congress and uh, those things could be pursued afterwards uh, after the may elections okay, thank, thank you. you dr reside anyone else okay, we move. okay. Can, yes dr can I just uh, give a quick response to uh, the question in relation to uh, calls for electoral reforms because at this point i mean the candidates are not going to <laughs> push for any electoral they're running on the same rules you know that uh, we want them to change 
And so it's not to be expected. Uh, I mean, very few, if any, you know, of the candidates would want to push for, uh, uh, let's say, reorganizing Comelec because I mean, Comelec is, <laughs> I mean, they're running under the rules that are administered by Comelec itself. And so uh, you, you don't expect that to happen during the election, but after the elections, once they sit, you know, in Congress, in the House, in, in the Senate, and uh, in the presidency, uh, that's the time to push for those kinds of uh, reforms. Uh, because then they would be, you know, uh, uh, farther away from the reforms that they want to, the, the rules rather, uh, and the procedures that they want to change. So, which is really uh, an ideal uh, way of pushing for, uh, you have to put some distance, you know, from the, from the things and the organizations, the institutions that you want to transform. So you love it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tigno. So we move on to the next question. Why is it that the question of political, economic, and electoral reforms is a common outcry of every political organization during election period? Does it mean there is no concrete solution to this and the government itself is the main player to its confusion? Anyone? Yeah, I, I think I, I just responded to this uh, in terms of electoral reforms. Um, I mean, you look at the platforms of these of all of the candidates. You know, I mean, wala walang nagpo push for electoral reform no? because precisely they are running under these very same rules. You know, uh, that that uh, they wouldn't want to change the rules in the middle of the game, right? Uh, and so what you need to do is to uh, push for those reforms after the elections or in between elections, uh, and that, you know that's what I think should should happen. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Veronica, can yes. I yes, add? Yes. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Uh, I think uh, what we should also understand, and when we talk about political participation and engaging with government, uh, we should not only focus on elections, because every three years, lang yon, di ba? Uh, of course, this is an important opening because we have uh, candidates who are presenting themselves, but of course, they have a uh, different... Uh, the focus now, of course, is on recovery from COVID and uh, economic uh, recovery and other things. But uh, issues regarding uh, legal reform can be pursued at uh, various stages of the political process. We need not wait for every, uh, every three years just to communicate our uh, uh, suggestions. And in fact, based on the experience of uh, many of us who have been providing policy inputs, our research uh, uh, research outputs with the uh, impact on policy. We have been sending our uh, our uh, research uh, outputs and policy recommendations to various offices, both at the executive and legislative level, with or without uh, elections, or uh, not necessarily during an election year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, is there actually a chance to elect a president representative of the minority? Because as we've seen today, these minorities who run for government posts lag behind the polls. Is there another alternative to ampli amplify their voice? Anyone? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, Dr. Tigno. Ang, ang presidente ay hindi lang presidente ng minority no? or even ng majority. Presidente ka ng buong bayan. No? So uh, it should not be the case that you have a president who will ignore or dismiss or threaten you know, uh, a minority. Uh, that's not what, <laughs> what uh, we expect a president to, to be doing. A president should, uh, as much as possible, you know, uh, attempt to create a popular consensus on uh, uh, reforms, you know, on transforming, you know, the the system economically, politically, socially, you know? uh, and so that's what I think should uh, should happen. I mean, uh, like I said, it's not only your constituency, you know, your base that you should uh, listen to. You should listen to everyone because now you're president of the entire country. So you love it. Thank you. And our next question is, hold on, um, pan pandemic affects 
students' learning, especially those courses with laboratory, research, engineering, etc. E-learning is not sufficient due to our slow internet. How can we maintain the quality of our graduates to meet the needs of SMEs to maintain the quality products produced of our country? Anyone? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh oh. Um, I answered it actually on the on the chat or the Q and A section. Um, just to summarize, I said that uh, one we could seriously consider bridge programs to be able to provide hands-on learning or experiential learning and competency development opportunities for students. No? That's one. The other one is, of course, the need for policy that will allow for transitions and reforms in higher education to happen. And third, the idea of micro-credentialing wherein um, higher education as, and um, workplaces collaborate so that the the hands-on opportunities are done in workplaces and these are vetted and credentialed by higher education institutions. And this makes up not only for competencies, but also for time. Thank you. Okay, B before we continue with our open forum, I just like, like to remind our participants this, that um, all those who will answer the uh, uh, evaluation form and submit it, will be given certificates. So the uh, link of the evaluation form is in our Zoom chat box. And also we will be releasing a copy of the presentation soon, along with a written copy of the governance agenda, as we will be flashing the downloadable link before the event ends. Okay, our next question is on uh, foreign relations. One of the recommendations to strengthen the foreign capabilities of the country is to bring in the academic community to engage in foreign policy discussions. May we know how the academic can contribute on this and what do you think could be done to make issues concerning foreign relations more accessible by the MASA? Um, Veronica, um, thank you very much for the question, no? um, because this is actually quite quite uh, uh, significant uh, in terms of, uh, I think, the idea that uh, 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 Professor Tapang was saying about consensus building or creating um, uh, constituencies no, around certain issues and foreign policy is one of those uh, key areas, I think. Um, one of the things, and, and I think the comparison here is that in other countries, now many of those are actually appointed to foreign policy positions now usually have academic credentials, right? Uh, and, and so there's that notion that, um, uh, that it'd be a good thing to actually have the academe actually uh, uh, have that kind of direct uh, uh, involvement no, as far as foreign policy making is actually concerned. But aside from that, actually, you can, have, you, you can see that um, in, in, in the ways that uh, uh, different um, um, academic fora, no webinars, no uh, the idea of coming up with policy papers, no. Um, these are mechanisms by which we try to reach out, no, uh, to the uh, to policymakers in terms of trying to uh, present them, no, with with ideas that have to do with uh, either issues, no, or long term strategic um, uh, thinking, no, on issues that concern foreign policy. Um, uh, in, in, in that in, in that sense, no, this, this go, goes back to what Ella was saying earlier on you know, about how uh, um, how it is that we can actually contribute you know, to the uh, uh, that, that these kinds of, kinds of contributions don't need to happen only during elections, right? So all throughout the life of a particular administration, you no know, policy um, uh, recommendations are being passed on, you no, know, uh, and uh, uh, are based on the discussions that take place. No? Um, and these same kinds of fora no, help contribute to the making of or creating creation of constituencies no, around particular issues, right? Um, the, the idea of webinars, seminars, no, conferences, um, and maybe uh, an additional thing that should be taken into consideration is how do you localize it? No? How do you bring these kinds of issues down to local communities so that the constituency is not just at the level of policy elites no, or academic elites, but also brings in no, local communities into the uh, conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kraft. Anyone else? Okay, that was our last question for the open forum. 
we would like to remind everyone again that we have placed the link to the evaluation form in the Zoom chat box. All those who will answer the evaluation form will be given a certificate of participation. Now we would like to present the hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 governance agenda recommendations in this video. Let's watch this. Hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda Pag-angat at pagsulong tungo sa magandang buhay at bukas policy recommendations Economic Recovery and Transformation To expedite economic recovery and to facilitate structural transformation, there is a need for institutional reforms to improve governance, increase spending for economic and social services while improving fiscal health, and increase foreign direct investments while supporting local industries to raise their competitiveness. National Social Protection Floor Implement the National Social Protection Floor for sustainable and inclusive development. This includes supporting the assessment-based national dialogue with a view to rationalizing and expanding social protection programs within a rights-based, universal, transformative social development strategy. There is also a need for a committed, purposeful, and deliberate action to build state capacity to implement the national social protection floor over time through progressive realization. Higher education. The government should ensure a consistent quality of and equitable access to education. Alternative modes of instruction and a flexible accreditation and recognition system should also be institutionalized. Industrial policy. There is a need to promote an industrial policy that prioritizes the development of the micro, small and medium enterprise sector as the building block of industrial development, promote synergies among manufacturing, agriculture, and services, builds Filipino ingenuity and capacities towards the development of niche industries, and jumpstart structural transformation. Public Transport a unified agency that has the capacity to oversee and address public transport concerns should be established for a more efficient implementation of public transport programs. Electoral and political reforms. Revise the Omnibus Election Code to streamline the electoral system and create a strong party system. Local governance. Resources provided to the LGUs should be commensurate with the services to be devolved and the capacity of the LGUs to sufficiently manage the resources and deliver public services. Ensure representation of the sectors and women in local government. And foreign relations. The Philippines needs a concrete plan of action guided by its strategic interests of safeguarding the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda Pag-angat at pagsulong tungo sa magandang buhay at bukas policy recommendations. Thank you for that video. Finally, to end our program, we would like to call on Dr. Antonio Batizab, Chair of the Task Force on a Blueprint for Building the Nation and Professor at the UP Asian Center to please deliver the synthesis and closing remarks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, before I begin, I'd like to actually call on the Chancellor. Uh, he wanted to, in fact, uh, say something during the open forum. So uh, I'd like, uh, may I call on uh, Fidel? I thank you all. Not tapos agad ng open forum, but I really wanted to say that uh, uh, in this webinar series, uh, we've only limited ourselves to nine policy areas. So, uh, there were a lot of constraints uh, among them at time, of course. But I hope that uh, this webinar series will stimulate other discussions in other areas as well. 
I can only uh, I can rattle no, rattle off uh, some of these areas that we need to address: um, uh, science and technology, ICT, agriculture, um, labor, uh, energy, health. We we have to talk about the environment. We have to talk about mass housing. We also need to talk about the military and police, the culture and the arts, etc. Malami pang iba. Again, uh, I want to say that this is part of our mission as a public service university to contribute and uh, intervene critically in policy discourse. The, the elections and the post-election period have given us an, an, an important opportunity to soul search and uh, rethink uh, development strategy and directions now. And we really need to convey the message that we, we need uh, more than a change of leaders. No? What we need really is a review of a lot of our assumptions. We need a longer view. Uh, we need uh, to create an, en an enabling policy environment. And of course, we need a national uh, integrated development program. And of course, a strong developmentally minded government to implement all this. No? And as a university, we need to partner with other institutions to build strong constitu constituencies around issues and their advocacies. No? Uh, again, this is this is part of our mandate as a, as a university, and this is why uh, UP Diliman has uh, launched uh, the Pilipi Lunas uh, series and are launching is launching this uh, governance agenda. Ayun lang. Thank you, Tanet. Thank you, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, okay, so um, with that, um, let me just uh, start with the closing remarks as as members of the task force on a blueprint for building the nation reaches the home stretch of our work. Allow me to thank everyone who has put in the time and effort to help us fulfill our mandate to launch a series of webinars to highlight the UP Diliman's, Diliman community's role as a policy actor. It, in, in the course of organizing the webinars, we were able to mobilize the expertise and energies of our colleagues. We were able to uh, we pushed ourselves to draw out the policy implications of our research and in the process shine a light on the role of the university as a source of and platform for public intellectuals in the best Gramscian tradition. To those who despite their busy schedules stayed the course, our profound thanks. The output of the nine webinars we held under the hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 series with the theme Pag-angat at Pagsulong Tungo sa Magandang Buhay at Bukas is the governance agenda that we are launching today. The agenda contains the policy recommendations that emerge from the presentations of UP professors and researchers engaged in dialogue with government, civil society, industry, and other stakeholders. Across the eight policy areas that we covered, there were at least are, are at least three recurring themes, three imper imperatives toward building an equitable and progressive nation. First is the need for institutional reforms to improve governance and government. Description of the government that were raised in the webinar include unified and cohesive, pur purposeful yet pragmatic, high capacity yet participatory toward ensuring policy cohesion, consistency, and follow through in the different policy arenas. This need was raised in the running of the public transport system and the social protection programs, as well as the call to build a strong party system. Second is the need to build connections, collaborations, and com complementarities between macro policies and selective intervention across different levels of government, and uh, education in the educational system and between the university and industry. Third is the need to ensure that stakeholders, especially those most directly impacted by changes and disruptions, are at the center of the development process. This is perhaps particularly true in the call for citizens to play a more active role in foreign policy formulation. The role that micro small uh, the micro, small, and medium enterprises sector be consulted in trade and investment policies, and that the Philippine science and technology community be integrated into the implementation of industrial policy. 
The discussions also focused on the need to address the coordination problem in what is after all a multi-actor process. When we look for institutions that can in fact help solve this problem, we see two, government and the university. Government because it has the resources, authority, and theoretically should be able to respond to the different public's interests and needs. But the university as an institution of learning occupies a distinct public space. Carrying out problem solving research, it may go beyond sectarian or political interests to widen the space for constructive dialogue toward arriving at the common good and on policies and programs that actually work. The hashtag Pilipilunas hopes it has contributed to this process. Before ending, allow me to thank the presenters. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Renato Reside, Dr. Uh, Dina Ocampo, Assistant Professor Ivy Claudio, Dr. Gani Tapang, Dr. Georgie Digno, um, Dr. Ella Akienza, and Dr. Uh, Professor Herman Kraft. I'd also like, of course, to thank Ms. Veronica Baluyo Jimenez, our moderator. Maraming salamat. The task force would also like to thank uh, the political economy pro the sponsors, the political economy program of the uh, Center for Integrative and Development Studies, CIDS, DZUP, and the Deliman Information Office for co-sponsoring the public launch. And finally, we'd also like to thank Chancellor Nemenso for his guidance and support. Needless to say, there are many more issues, as uh, the Chancellor mentioned, that confront our country, and, we are, we've, and we've only just tackled a few. We hope that the process we started with hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 will continue, that agenda building and advocacy will not start and end with elections, as everybody's already mentioned, and that perhaps we have started a process on how the university can do policy work um, in a more consistent and systematic fashion. So to everyone, maraming maraming salamat. Um, we will, you can have a, get a copy of the governance agenda, read it, and we hope that we will be, that you will be with us when we start advocating the policy recommendations that that contain. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakiza. Before we end our program, we would like to inform everyone that the hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Governance Agenda Pag-angat at Pagsulong Tung sa Magandang Buhay at Bukas is now accessible and available to download. You may read the executive summary by accessing the link shown on the screen and in the Zoom chat box. Once again, this has been Veronica Baluitimenez. Thank you very much and have a pleasant day.